Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Gospel lesson, Luke chapter 9. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. So, a Wyoming sheep rancher was approached one day by a stranger who was wearing a suit. The stranger said, If I can guess how many sheep you've got, may I have one? Thinking this was impossible, that he didn't have a chance, the rancher agreed. You have 1,795 sheep. Stunned by the correct answer, the rancher told him to choose his sheep. The man selected an animal and slung it over his shoulder and started to walk away. The rancher said, ah, hey, hey, you know, if I can tell you who you work for, can I have that animal back? Uh, all right, said the man. You work for the government, said the rancher. Well, how did you figure that out? Well, said the rancher, you can put down my dog and I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, today we're going to talk about being mistaken and about being surprised when we find out the truth. For the disciples, when we catch up to them in our text, the, the light of Jesus' stardom has just been rising. He's been doing miracles. He's healing the sick. He just fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. They were starting to believe that nothing could stop them now. Jesus led them up a mountain, and there he became transfigured. Luke says Jesus was praying, and the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing became dazzling white. Two men appeared and began talking with Jesus. These were the great heroes of the Jewish faith, Moses and Elijah. And then a cloud came down, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. For Peter, James, and John, their ride just seemed to keep getting better and better. Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and now even God the Father, this is my chosen one. Listen to him. I bet they were now positive that nothing was going to stop them from going right to the top. Moses and Elijah were probably talking to Jesus about his upcoming victory. That may be what the disciples thought they saw. They were mistaken. Luke tells us what was really happening. <clears throat> At once the two men who were talking to him turned out to be Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. This exodus, they're referring to the one in the Old Testament. It was the great rescue of God's people in the Old Testament. Moses led them out of the slavery in Egypt. Jesus' exodus would be far greater than Moses. Jesus had come to set everyone free from the slavery to sin and death. And he could only accomplish that with his own death. That was the plan that the disciples did not see coming. Later, in fact, when Jesus told the disciples plainly what was going to happen, that he was going up to Jerusalem and would be betrayed and killed, Peter spoke for all of them when he said, This will never be, Lord. You're not going to die. You're going to conquer. There on the mountain, the glory of Jesus was shining. 
And the real goal, the real plan was being discussed. This was a plan that went far beyond the conquest of Jerusalem. Jesus led them down the mountain to their camp and from this time Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. His mission became more and more focused on the goal. The goal of paying the entire debt of sin for everyone who has ever lived. What happened after the Mount of Transfiguration for his followers seemed all messed up. The light seemed to go out. Jesus was betrayed. He was made a prisoner. He was condemned, even though he was innocent. He was killed on a Roman cross. It was injustice. It looked to them like evil one. Jesus could not mean to die a death like that. But that was exactly what Jesus meant to do. The church has created the season of Lent that begins this week to help remind us of how serious our condition is. Our sins are like a fire that is burning out of control. We can't stop it and we can't hold it back. Every sin and any sin gives us the sentence of death. In Lent, we remember the Son of God who crashed right into the burning heart of our sin. He paid the full price, suffering death and hell in our place. And then Jesus emerged from the inferno, from death and hell alive. He went in there for us and he saved us. Now, if you've been listening to me for a few years, and some of you have been listening to me for a lot more than just a few years, you're probably, I hope, kind of nodding your head going, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we've heard this before, Pastor. Jesus' closest followers did not get the real mission he was on, the one that he accomplished on the cross. Okay, we know about them. Today, we need to talk about us. Jesus came to save us, to set us free from our sins. His forgiveness is not just a one-time event. It happens over and over again in our life. Forgiveness is something that we need all the time. Sometimes we're more conscious of the fact that we need forgiveness, but as long as we live and are alive, we will need Christ's forgiveness. The thing that puts us in a tight spot, that holds us back from fully finding the wonder of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, is how hard it is to believe the things that Jesus has promised us. In John 6, Jesus says, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. 1 John 1 says, If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, how does this work for us? You have told the Lord that you will follow Him. And at times, it's gone pretty well. But there are a few sins that seem to trip you up. Once in a while, they sneak up on you and hit you in the head. And you're left wondering, how did that happen again? Now at those times, it's not too difficult to go to the Lord and confess. Confess that it's hard to know just how it happened again, Lord, but it did. I'm sorry. But then, there are the other times. The times when you begin to consider this sin. You sort of roll it around in your head. 
Maybe you even have the two angel syndrome going on, you know? The good angel on one shoulder and the bad one on the other, and they argue the merits of this thing that you're considering. <clears throat> Somewhere deep inside you, the law is ringing the bell of warning, but it gets softer and softer. And finally, you act on the sin. Now, you're in a bad place. This is deliberate sin at its worst. Now, the last person you want to see or talk with is Jesus. It's sort of like this. Have you ever finally just let it all go? Just finally just started letting all that criticism of a fellow worker or even a friend really just getting it all out of yourself and just what you think about the way they are so much less than you expect them to be and suddenly there they are right in front of you or you're talking about your company and what a miserable excuse for an employer they are and the boss comes around the corner the last person you expected or wanted to see, how much did they hear? What should I say now? You see, it's much worse than that with Jesus. Jesus is always present. He's always around the corner. Jesus hears everything. Every argument that you made in your head, head, every rationalization that you could use before you sin. When sin brings the war to you and you cave in and go along with it, you can start to wonder if even Jesus will forgive you again. The person you need to go to is the last person you want to go to. It's like you're trying to hide. And even when you're in church, you just don't get that feeling of freedom when you hear the absolution. You pick up a Bible and now yeah, you put it back down. And there's a voice in your head saying, who are you to read his holy book? Faithfully following him. What a joke. He doesn't want to see you. And this is where you're mistaken. God is not keeping score. Jesus will never say to you, you know, <laughs> this is the fifth time this week you've come to me. He doesn't count how many times you've come to repent. Every time is a new time. And Jesus will never refuse you. Those that are forgiven are not or not for, are, those that are not forgiven are not forgiven because they do not have faith they do not believe that Jesus can or wants to forgive them don't let that happen to you don't let your failures and treachery to Jesus keep you from going back to him and confessing Judas and Peter both denied the Lord. Judas could not make himself go back to the Lord for forgiveness. And he died in his sins. Peter could not stay away from the love and compassion of Christ. And Peter was forgiven and restored to his place in the kingdom. Jesus' exodus his great act of salvation is always there for us. Only unbelief removes it. Suffering humiliating defeats by sin can help keep us humble. We are all just sinners saved by grace. If you think you're beyond Jesus' forgiveness, or maybe worse, you think you don't need his forgiveness, you don't think that what he says is a sin is really a sin. You are mistaken. You may believe that you're carrying a sheep, but you're really carrying a dog. Surprise! 
Jesus came here for sinners. And with his forgiveness, we are picked up and put back into the fight. And perhaps the next time, we might win. We will try. And even if it's a pitiful attempt and we fail, the Savior will meet us just like a father who loves his son or daughter even though they have rejected him. Don't let your pride hold you back. Don't let that terrible feeling of going to the one person who knows everything you thought and said, don't let that stop you. Jesus is waiting. His love and his forgiveness is for sinners, just like you and me. Our guilt and our pride can keep us from experiencing the grace of Jesus, from finding out that He wants us to come home. His forgiveness is for us. Yes, even us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And the peace of Christ which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <laughs>